Uh, that day, <clears throat> that weekend, the picnic, baptism, food pack sort of celebrates the best of the story of FBCG. And some of you may know uh, the story of FBCG. Some of you may have not heard me talk about this uh, over the recent months or years. But let me just give you a, just a little short version of the history of this that you're a part of here today. In 1894, a small group of Swedish immigrants who lived in Geneva but thought that Batavia was too far to travel to go to church, founded their own Swedish Baptist church called the First Swedish Baptist Church of Geneva. Uh, they built their first building in 1904, so it took them 10 years to get strong enough to build their first building. It's still there on Anderson Boulevard in Geneva. The little church often struggled and for many years couldn't even afford to have a part-time pastor, let alone a full-time pastor, but slowly they grew. And in the 1920s, one of the great stories was the men of the church went down to the basement of that old building and dug out by hand a new room for the children to have Sunday school in. And it continued on that way until 1951 when they changed the name. It took a long time, but they finally changed the name from First Swedish Baptist Church of Geneva to the First Baptist Church of Geneva. And it was 20 years after they stopped using Swedish in the services. The result was more growth. And in 1962, they relocated to South Street, which is the current site of our East Campus, the church grew a little more. In 1984, they built a new sanctuary, which is our East Campus Sanctuary today. More growth happened in 1994. I say we because I was here by this time. We built the Family Life Center, which we call now the Student Ministry Center at the far west end of the East Campus. And in 2004, uh, we became a multi-campus church by building the first phase out here at the West Campus where we sit here today. Now, in 2014, as many of you know, we are expanding again in what we call our Growing to Serve Ministry Expansion Project. But the question is why? Uh, why has this church family invested the time, the resources, and the effort over all those years to keep expanding? Why not just stay at Anderson Boulevard in Geneva, that little church, and just be done with it? Why? Well, because it's the very nature of the gospel to grow. We believe verses like, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And we believe that when we proclaim this gospel, the church will grow. Now, I remind you of that little piece of our story because of the story we're studying all summer long. We're in a summer long series from the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament called Hand Me Another Brick. It's an ancient story, but there are all kinds of parallels to what we do today as the church and even to our own individual stories as well. Let me give you a cliff note summary. This is week nine of the series. Let me give you a brief summary. Nehemiah is a Jew living in exile in Persia. He's cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. He hears news that comes to him all the way from Jerusalem that the walls of Jerusalem are still broken down and the gates burned by fire, so he grieves and he goes before God in fasting and prayer. Then he gets up the courage to go to King Artaxerxes and he shares his sadness. Artaxerxes asks him what he needs, what he wants to do. And so he makes a plan. Nehemiah then leads the people, travels all the way to Jerusalem, leads the people in this great project of rebuilding the ancient walls of the great city. He faces and overcomes all kinds of opposition. And in 52 days, the project is finished. And that leads us up to where we are today. We're going to pick it up in Nehemiah chapter 7, first three verses. Let me read them for you. After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and the musicians and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most people do. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts, um, some near their own houses. Now we're going to pause there. We're going to read more later. First thing we see here is Nehemiah demonstrating what I would call true leadership. Nehemiah demonstrates true leadership. Everyone here tonight, pretty much, I would guess, knows who George Washington was, right? Everybody recognize that face? wasn't just on the dollar bill. He was actually first president of the United States. But how many of you know that after serving two terms as the first president of the United States, he was begged to serve a third term and he refused. In fact, some wanted him to be king, but he refused that too. Didn't want to serve a third term. How many of you knew that? Did you know that? He refused. 
He refused, historians say, for two main reasons. First, he wanted to retire, go back to his plantation in Mount Vernon. But secondly, he simply believed it was better for the future of the nation that leadership not be focused on one man. And in many ways, Nehemiah was a little bit like Mr. Washington. Think about it. Nehemiah led the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem that also served to rebuild a nation. He inspired a ragtag group of downtrodden people to courageously fight off enemies that were seeking their destruction. And then, when he had accomplished so much, he could easily have laid claim to an enormous amount of power and control in the city he had rebuilt, he demonstrates true leadership by delegating that leadership. Listen again. After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, gatekeepers, musicians, Levites are appointed, I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani along with Hanani, the commander of the citadel. Now, a couple things here. First, I noticed that Nehemiah was a finisher. He was a finisher. Pastor Sterling mentioned last weekend, and he did so very powerfully, that Nehemiah was a man of both opportunity and influence what leadership is, but he was also a finisher. And that's no small thing. See, starting things is easy. Finishing is hard. Ideas are easy. Execution is hard. Nehemiah was a finisher. He finishes what he set out to do. The wall rebuilt, check. Doors in place, check. Gatekeepers appointed for security purposes, check. Musicians and Levites in place to lead worship, check. And you might wonder, what's that about? Well, the musicians and Levites were positioned to lead the people in the celebration of worship. We'll get there in a couple of weeks. But now, and only now, is Nehemiah ready for the last check, and that is to delegate leadership. He chooses two men that can be trusted to lead. Their names are Hanani and Hananiah. Interesting little detail. I found out that both those names have their roots in the Hebrew word for grace. Not sure what that means. Maybe leadership requires a certain degree of grace. Not sure what, but it's kind of interesting. He chooses Hanani because way back in chapter 1, Hanani was the one who brought him word from Jerusalem that the walls were still broken down. So Hanani cared enough to bring the message to Nehemiah, so he chooses him. Then he chooses Hananiah, not only because he was a, a leader himself, uh, but also because of this phrase, a man of integrity who fears God more than most. What a great phrase. Apply that to yourself. Does it work? Does it fit? A person of integrity who fears God more than most. Question, why does Nehemiah delegate leadership? Why would he choose to delegate authority instead of holding on to it as his right and privilege? Think about that for a minute. Nehemiah is the one who risked his life and reputation by sharing his sadness with uh, King Artaxerxes. Nehemiah is the one who put the entire plan together. Nehemiah is the one who faced the opposition of people who wanted to kill him. It was Nehemiah's vision from the get-go. And now, just when you think he might be thinking about how to enjoy his position of respect and power that would surely have been his, he just hands it over. He hands over leadership. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us Nehemiah's reasons. We can't get into his head but I think we can make a few guesses based on what we already know about this man. For example, we know that the whole project was never about Nehemiah. Not right from the beginning. It was always about God and his desire for his people. Nehemiah knew the city didn't belong to him. It belonged to God. We also know that Nehemiah's vision was born in fasting and prayer. Remember, he grieved and he prayed and he fasted for weeks. So I think we can assume that just as his vision began by listening to God, he also decided to pull back out of obedience to God. He knew it wasn't about him. He knew his own call and his gifts. He knew these two men were prepared and ready to lead, and so he leaves them in position to succeed. Again, he says, I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards. Now here Nehemiah is sharing a bit of his leadership wisdom and experience with these two young leaders, specifically about security protocols. And we can kind of miss this. But in the ancient world, gates were often opened at sunrise to begin a day of commerce and business. And they were shut at sunset to provide security. He's saying, take it a step further. Don't even open the gates until the sun is hot. 
Meaning, give the city time to wake up. Give people time to prepare, because you never know when the enemy is going to attack. So be careful. And shut the gates while everybody's still on duty and everything is protected. He's given them security protocols. He's preparing his successors for success. So, what can we learn from Nehemiah at this part of the story? I think what we can learn is, it's not about us. It's not about us. Whatever leadership role God has given you, whether it be as a parent, a Sunday school teacher, CEO of a Fortune 500 company, know this, it's not about you. It's not. God's call on our lives is always about two things. God's will and other people. Nehemiah understood that. We can also learn that the leadership task is not finished until we've identified and equipped someone else to take our place. That's what we learn from Nehemiah. Secondly, in this part of the story, we see Nehemiah reaching out. He reaches out. How many of you have your own personal Facebook profile? You got a Facebook page? Good, you can admit it, you know, it's all right. How many of you have never even seen Facebook? <laughs> all right. How many of you don't even know what I'm talking about? Face what? Face what? Okay. Now, I know Facebook is a Pandora's box of sorts. It's the useless and trivial pile on top of photos of what your friends ate for dinner last night. I know that. But hear me out. At some kind of fundamental level, I believe Facebook exists because people matter. Facebook exists because people matter. We build our profiles. We post our comments. We share our photos because we believe that we matter to someone out there. We want to matter to someone, and we want to stay connected in some way to the people that matter to us. And Facebook's only one of the many ways that we do this. If you have a cell phone, how many of you have cell phones? Okay, you have, a, you have a contact list in there, people who matter to you, so you can dial up their numbers. You may have an old address book somewhere. It's got addresses in it, people who matter to you or one time mattered to you. Let's read this next portion of this book with that in mind, People Matter. Nehemiah chapter 7. This is a long, strange passage, so hang with me. In fact, I tried just to sign this to one of the other preachers this summer. It kept bouncing back to me. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. Let me pause there for a second. The wall is finished, but there's a problem. Not enough people are living inside the city. Now, that happened over the 100 years or so since the Babylonians destroyed the wall. People didn't live inside the wall anymore because they didn't trust it. There was no wall. So they moved out and moved around, started their farms and so forth, got land. And so they're all living outside of the city limits. They all came in to help Nehemiah build the wall because they thought that was important. But now they're going back to where they live outside the wall, and that's a problem. The city can't thrive unless the people trust the wall and move inside. Nehemiah has now got to invite and convince people to repopulate the city. Continue. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. Now let's pause there. Once again, we see that Nehemiah must have been praying about this. He says, and God put it into my heart. Do you, guys, do you know that God still does that today? Do you know that if you pray and you listen and you pay attention, God will speak to you? He will put things into your heart. Notions, promptings, directions, ideas. And here he gives Nehemiah a great idea. Nehemiah continues, And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at the first, and I found written in it. Pause. What genealogy? What's he talking about? Well, some years before, when Ezra brought the first waves of people back to try to repopulate the city when they were given permission, only about 2% of the total number of exiles came back and tried to rebuild the city, he made a list of everyone who went back with him because they were, they were the, the pioneers, the people who were honoring God. He made this list of the genealogy, sort of a census. Nehemiah finds that, and his idea is to use that to recruit the grandchildren of the people who one time had come to rebuild the city to come back in and finish the job their grandparents had started. Brilliant idea, and God gave it to them. He continues, These were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramiah, Nehemiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispareth, Bigvi, Nahum, and Banah. If you think I've read hard names so far, I'm not even started, okay? 
the number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Parash, 2,172, the sons of Shephaniah, I, I practiced that too. Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Era, 652. The sons of Par, pa, <laughs> Pahath, Moab, namely the sons of Jeshu and Joab, 2818. The sons of Elam, 1254. The sons of Zatu, 845. The sons of Zakai, 760. The sons of Binui, 648. The sons of Bebai, 628. The sons of Asgad, I love that name, 2322. The sons of Adonikam, 667. The sons of Bigvi, 2067. The sons of Aden, 655. The sons of Ater, namely of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Hashum, 328. The sons of Bezai, 324. The sons of Harif, 112. The sons of Gibeah, 95. I'm going to stop there. There's about two more paragraphs of that if you read chapter 7 of Nehemiah, which was why I was hoping somebody else had to preach it this weekend. Now, if you're like me and you see ancient lists of names like that in the Bible, you're tempted to skim, right? You see the list of names, I'll jump over to the next part of the chapter. After all, they're strange sounding, they're hard to pronounce, hard to read. But there are a number of places in the Bible, and Bruce pointed this out a few weeks ago, where lists of names occur. A number of places. In fact, scholars tell us there are over 2,500 personal names recorded in the Bible. So why is this long list of tongue-twisting names and precise census numbers included in the story of Nehemiah? Why does God want us to read these names some 4,000 years after the event? Well, I think this part of chapter 7 is kind of like an ancient Facebook page. Pardon the illustration. God is saying these people mattered to him. They mattered. They mattered to the great story of Jerusalem and in the story of what he wants to do in the whole world. I think that's why the Bible includes so many names. I think that's why Nehemiah went through the painstaking process of finding that list and identifying every single family that came back and all their distant relatives so he could recruit them because people matter. People mattered to God. They mattered to Nehemiah in two ways. First, Nehemiah wanted people to know God's protection his provision, and his love. That's what the wall represented. And I think that's an image of salvation. That's God's provision of safety, of security, of hope. It's a precursor to Jesus Christ in the gospel. Secondly, Nehemiah wants them to participate with him in the great effort to rebuild the city and make it strong because he knows that's God's purpose in the world. So he uses the list of returned exiles to invite and challenge all those still living outside the walls to come join the effort. Now, here at FBCG, making the jump to today, we too believe that people matter to God. Not just people like us. Not just people who look like us, dress like us, talk like us, believe like us. All people. You know that neighbor that walks their dog in your, across your yard? You know what I mean? You know that coworker that takes your stuff out of the fridge? You know that roommate? All people. All people matter to God. Our Serve the World initiative includes local ministry partners like Emmanuel House that enables working families, many of them refugees from war-torn parts of the world, to escape the cycle of poverty to purchase their own homes. That's what we're involved in. In Ukraine, Stephen's House will one day provide a safe haven for young men who are special needs, largely forgotten and outcast by their society. Our Growing to Serve ministry expansion project includes new space right out there. Look out the wall and you'll see the beginnings of it for what we call Masterpiece Ministries, special needs kids and their families. We do those things simply because the Bible tells us people matter. All people. Chances are you're here tonight you're here today because somewhere, sometime, someone thought you mattered. Someone thought you mattered to God. Someone reached out to you, and you're here. So when you see a list of names like this in the Bible, don't skim. Try not to skip over it. Try to read them. Have fun pronouncing them. When you come to awesome names like Zetu, Zekai, and Asgad, find another son I'd name his middle name Asgad. How, co how cool would that be? Asgad. Ask God to help you pay attention. Not just to those names, but pay attention to the people all around you every day who don't know yet that they matter to the God who created them. Thirdly, the wall is ultimately about God. That's what we see in the story. The wall is ultimately about God. 
A few weeks ago, I had a chance to uh, go to Ecuador with one of our student short-term mission teams for five days. Uh, the last day we were there, I was with Sterling and a few other guys, Ken O'Brien and some others. Uh, I had to leave a little bit early, so the last day we visited uh, in Quito this incredible church called the Basilica de Voto Nacional. Magnificent structure, incredibly ornate. Twin steeple towers over 300 feet high. Dozens of priceless stained glass windows, massive stone walls, marble floors. I read on a plaque on the front of the church building, it took a 100 years to construct. How about that for a building project? A hundred years. As I walked around it and thought about it later, I thought about two things. First, someone thought God was worth that a hundred years ago. Someone somewhere thought God was worth that effort. Incredible. But the second thing was, I noticed that the basilica itself, the sanctuary, was almost empty, except for a bunch of tourists walking around. With those thoughts in mind, let me finish this part, uh, chapter of Nehemiah. The whole company numbered 42,360 beside their 7,337 7, male and female slaves. And they also had 245 male and female singers. There were 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6,720 donkeys. You ever notice Nehemiah was a man of detail? Detail. Some of the heads of the families contributed to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 derricks of gold. 50 bowls and 530 garments for the priests. Some of the heads of the families gave to the treasury for the work. 20,000 derricks of gold and 2,200 minas of silver. The total given by the rest of the people was 20,000 derricks of gold and 2,000 minas of silver and 67 garments for the priests. The priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the temple servants, along with certain of the people and the rest of the Israelites, settled in their own towns. Now, three things here. First, the project was about God's glory and reputation. Remember how the story started? Nehemiah hears word, the walls are broken down. He grieves. He grieves. Why? He grieves because with no wall, the city has no protection. More than that, it was God's city. And if there's no wall around God's city, God's reputation was damaged. God is being, being ridiculed and despised by the nations around. God's glory could not be seen. There was no wall. He grieved because God deserved better than that. So he not only rebuilt the wall, but he called people to bring their gifts to complete the temple that was inside the wall, the place of worship. Notice there's clothing for the priests. There's bowls that were used in worship. There's gold and silver. A derrick of gold was a coin of ancient Persia worth about five bucks. So 20,000 of them was about $100,000, significant gift. A pound of silver was called a mina. And so if you have 2,200 of those, it's about $600,000 gift. These are significant gifts. But here's the point. Families and individuals brought their wealth because they thought God was worth it. They brought their wealth because they thought God was worth it. Here at this church, we teach generosity in all its forms. We teach people to grow along what we call the generosity pathway, from first steps to extravagant generosity. And we do that not because God needs our money. He doesn't. He doesn't need anything that we have. We don't do it because we're trying to build facilities. We do it because we believe God's worth it. We believe God is worth it. So ask yourself this question. What does my generosity say that I think about God? We believe God's worth it. Second, the project was about God's love for people. It's about God's love for people. It wasn't about a wall. It's about God's love for people. We have two big initiatives here at FBC that drive everything we do right now. Growing to Serve, three-year ministry expansion project, and what we call Serve the World, our initiative to make the gospel visible in tangible ways to local and global ministry partners. And both of those efforts are only worth it, first of all, if God is worth it, and second of all, if God truly loves every single person on the planet the same way. If he doesn't, then we're wasting our time and our money. But if he's worth it and he loves every person, then everything we do in those two categories is worth it. Thirdly, the project was about God's great purpose in the world. It's about God's purposes in the world. Jumping over to the New Testament, from the Old Testament, from the strangers of that world, listen for echoes of the Nehemiah story and what Peter tells us about the church. 1 Peter chapter 2. As you come to him, 
a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you and, who, and, and you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. It's the same story. The point of the story of Nehemiah is not the wall. The point of the church is not the buildings. The point is God's purpose and God's glory. The point is God's salvation offered in love to all people who matter for him. And that's what I think about in my best moments when I'm walking around looking at this project take shape. Can't wait to show you what's happening at the East Campus. Can't wait to see what happens here. First, it strikes me that even though FBCG has been around for 120 years, a lot of things have stayed the same. Lots changed, but lots stayed the same. We still worship together. We still care about each other. We still believe the world matters to God. We still believe the gospel is worthy to be proclaimed. All that stays the same. I think about that. But secondly, I think about this. I watched the concrete blocks going in and the different parts of construction, beams and drywall and so forth, and it strikes me that every single piece, every single brick, every single block, every single piece of drywall, every single nail could represent a person or a family that went before. It could. I have no idea how many thousands of men, women, and children have been part of this church over the years. I have no idea. I just know that they went before, and I benefit from that. The church is not built of bricks and mortar. It's built of living stones, Peter says. People who love and serve and give because God's worth it. Peter says the walls of the church are made of living stones. That's us. Just as Nehemiah rebuilt the wall because it symbolized the glory and blessing of God, so also the church is to be a spiritual house that offers sacrifices to God. And that's what I hope will fill your heart as you walk around and look at what's happening. We get to do this. We get to be part of this. We're invited by the Lord himself to play our part in the great story of God's love for the world. We get to play a part in building and being his church. We get to proclaim the excellencies of the one who called us out of darkness. We get to do that. And we do it for the same reason that Nehemiah did it. God's worth it. He's worth it. Will you bow with me in prayer? Actually, stand for a closing prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for this ancient story. Thank you for these lists of strange names to our tongue. Thank you for including us in your great family for inviting us to the joy of your salvation. May we each take our place as living stones in your great project called the church.